fire in the hole. Man, today's just going to hell. This video is brought to you by Sportsman's Guide, your one-stop shop for all your outdoor needs. Check them out at www.sportsmansguide.com. Welcome to another video here at Ordnance Lab, our first one after being resurrected from the dead with YouTube. We'll talk about that later on and some other stuff, but today what we're going to be talking about is a variety of different ways you can initiate explosives, the primary being electric and non-electric. Now, this right here is not going to cover all the different ways you can possibly initiate explosives because we'd be here all day long. Instead, what we're going to focus on is the ones that we use primarily here at Ordnance Lab and what you actually see out there in the real world for like blasting and various other ways of setting off explosives. So y'all may have clearly noticed that we're missing some videos from before on here. Those are all available on Utreon. We're going to be working on migrating a lot of our content on there. We're still going to have the stuff featured on YouTube, but what's going to happen is we're going to have our spicier content. That's going to be there on Utreon. There's also going to be some specific Utreon only content. We're working on getting that stuff together. We've been so busy trying to get our new facility here in South Texas up and running that we haven't had a chance to make many videos. But once all that stuff's wrapped up, there's going to be a lot more content on there of things that you're not going to be able to see here on our YouTube channel. All right, well, first up is the blasting machine that we use for most of our blasting here at Ordnance Lab. This right here is built from a factory. It's really nothing special. All it does is send an electrical impulse down the wire. At the heart of it, it's just a, oh, drop the cap, but it's a nine volt battery that you can actually use on its own for blasting, but that lacks a lot of the safety features. So what we'll do now, we'll cut away to Jake. You can actually talk about all the technical details that make my head hurt. Well, it wouldn't be an Ordnance Lab video without some type of scientific explanation and demonstration as to what we're doing here. Otherwise, we'd just be messing around and we obviously don't do that here. We're totally professional. All right, so what we're gonna do is demonstrate the difference between the low voltage source, which is a nine volt battery, which we have here, and the blasting machine, which is our high voltage source. And the idea here is that we're gonna discharge it into a circuit simulating a blasting circuit and showing the voltage drop and how it's significant with the nine volt battery, but, all, but irrelevant with the high voltage source, such as the blasting machine. But first off, a little history lesson because it's actually kind of relevant to this topic. A long time ago, in the end of the 1800s, there was a little debate or a little argument between a certain individual by the name of Nikola Tesla and another guy by the name of Thomas Edison. And they were fighting over which system to use, DC or AC. Tesla wanted AC and Edison wanted DC. And the problem with Edison's system though is that we'd have to have power plants basically all over a city to power a neighborhood because with DC, especially back then, they had no way of getting the voltage high enough that you could transmit that voltage over a long distance. With um, Tesla's system, he could actually produce a high voltage source which transmits, uh, was able to transmit electricity over long distances with a minimal amount of loss of power. And this is why AC is so preferable and we see it all over the world. In the, in the Americas, it's 120 volts, whereas in Europe, it's like 220, but it's all alternating current. A little side fact, Edison, to demonstrate how horrible AC was, he actually had to use DC and actually killed animals in public. He was not a great guy. Even though he did do some great things, by himself, he was a horrible person. I mean, if you ever want to look up something horrible, he actually publicly executed an elephant using DC and claimed it was AC just to discredit uh, Tesla. That's pretty messed up. Okay, so why is a high voltage system preferable over a low voltage system? Why not just hook up a battery to the circuit and set off the explosive? Well, there's a really specific reason why. You see, we want to keep a good distance from our explosions, right? So we need a good amount of wire and that increases the amount of resistance and we don't want to lose all that energy through the resistance of the wire and the circuit. And the benefit of having a lot of a higher voltage system is less energy loss in the transmission. So with a battery, because it has this limit or a max amount of wattage, and the wattage is, it can be equated to volts times amps, right? So if it's nine volts, that means that the current has to be really high. Whereas with the blasting machine, where the voltage is high, the current output is very low, but the wattage stays the same because the battery is also the limit to the blasting machine's total watt potential. Okay, nothing too crazy. Now, because of this, when we increase the voltage, we have to increase the amperage, but the wattage stays the same, and then from there we can calculate the voltage drop. So with the voltage drop, we use Ohm's law. 
and Ohm's law is E equals I times R, named after the physicist George Ohm, or the German physicist, as Sean would like to re reinforce, because German, you know, you know, whatever. So E equals I times R, E is the voltage or electromotive force, I is resistance, or sorry, current for some reason, and R is resistance. I get, sorry about that. So we can calculate the voltage drop by calculating, multiplying the resistance to the current. Well, obviously this is gonna have a high current uh, from because it has a lower voltage, so that means the voltage drop will be more significant with the battery. Whereas with the voltage drop with the blasting machine, will be far less and we'll have a better, larger impulse at the end to ensure that the blasting or the blasting cap detonates. All right, for this demonstration, we're gonna test the battery and the blasting machine's output without the hookup hooked up to a circuit. And then we're gonna test the output and the voltage drop when we hook up to a circuit that is basically a breadboard with a 45 ohm resistor. So I calculated the total ohmage of the spool of wire that we use is about a thousand feet of 20 gauge copper wire and a two ohm blasting cap, which comes out to be roughly 45 ohms approximately. First, let's measure the voltage off this battery to have a baseline for this one. Okay, so it's about 8.36 volts, give or take. It's fluctuating because this battery is a little bit low. And that's fine though. It's a low voltage source, so it's gonna serve its purpose perfectly. Well, and now we can hook it up to the circuit and measure the voltage drop. All right, so I have the battery here and we have it hooked up to the circuit. Now let's connect it uh, or complete the circuit and measure the voltage drop. I, by, by my calculations, we should have about five volts of drop estimated. Uh, it might be a little bit less, a little bit more, but hey, let's find out. Hook it up here and it's fluctuating, it's about 4.9 to 4.10 volts here. So that means that, yeah, we have about four volts of drop, a little bit more than that, which is pretty eh, close to my calculations. But that's a pretty significant drop. That's 50% of the total output of this battery. That means that on the other end of the circuit, it would struggle to set off the blasting cap. It may not set off the blasting cap at all. This is why the ba this battery, particularly this one, is a bad choice. All right, so now we have the blasting machine hooked up to the voltmeter. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna discharge this into the voltmeter and measure the voltage output. Now, this is not gonna be exactly the same every single time, because the thing is, is that this charges up a capacitor bank and then it releases it. But each time it gets a little bit less and it's actually been very inconsistent. We actually were tested, testing this out earlier and we were getting numbers all over the place. But right now it's throwing at it consistently about 132 to 140 volts. So let's charge it up and we'll what is wait for this circuit in here to charge up a capacitor bank and then the other switch which also is pretty neat is because it's also the safety if you release it it discharges the capacitor bank for a safety reason because you do not want to get this shot into you it'd be horrible and discharge okay so i got 132 volts again right there so we're let's say that it's 132 volts okay now we have the blasting machine connected to the simulated blasting circuit and that's connected to the voltmeter. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna charge it up and discharge it into that resistor. Now the problem is though, and I've done this before many times, usually when it comes to <laughs> discharging an impulse into a resistor, especially a, a small one like this, because I don't have one of the heavy duty ones, it's probably gonna blow up the resistor. The voltage drop by my calculations was about half a volt. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Despite going through a thousand feet of wire both ways, because remember we run two circuits, so both both sides of the wire contribute to the resistance. And yet, despite all that, it's still only getting half a volt of drop. So most likely, this this resistor is gonna snap open. You'll hear a pop. All right, ready? Let's charge it up. Once we have the green light, we discharge it. And here we go. Yep. And as expected, it completely fried the resistor. That means that, well, hey, despite going through a simulated thousand feet of wire, it still had enough energy to blow this uh, blow this resistor. And this is why there's a plenty of energy at the end of the wire to blow up a blasting cap. Actually, this thing can actually set off several blasting caps. And that's one of the best things about this. This would never do it. But then we put it inside this machine and it can easily do that. And that's what I like about this. And this is why we use it so much. It is safe. It's very effective and it, it takes a simple nine volt battery, which we can easily find anywhere, charges it up and we're able to set off multiple blasting caps without any problems. And because it's safe, also the safety feature is the charging mechanism right here. Also, if you release it, it stops charging and then it bleeds down. See inside the capacitor bank, it's bridged over with the resistor that slowly bleeds it off. Well, actually in this case, it bleeds it off pretty fast. And that way you don't have a bunch of charge that's sitting around. And if you accidentally touch the contacts, you shock yourself. All right, so what did we learn? That one, Tesla was a way better person and way more no innovative than Edison, in my opinion. Of course, that's my opinion. Take it with a grain of salt. If you have an opinion different than that, be sure to put it in the comments. I'd love to hear your input on that matter, but I'm not like Edison did some great things, but I'm not a big fan of him. He was a pretty horrible guy. And that batteries, 
Yes, they can be used, but they have limitations. We learned a little bit of electronics, about uh, electricity, about what watts, volts. Of course, if you need more information about that, I can definitely recommend some other channels. There's actually a really good channel I like to watch. It's the Science Asylum, and he goes over this topic uh, ad nauseum. Be sure to check him out if you want to learn more about that. I wish I could go further, but this channel is not about electronics. It's about explosives. And then lastly, we learned that high voltage blasting machines such as this is the preferred method of electronic command detonation. Well, I've yammered on enough. Let's head over to the range and blow something up with the blasting machine. All right, so the way this works is you charge it. This is a safety feature. It'll charge up the capacitor bank. When it's ready, you'll get a green light and you press the button and boom. Yeah. So Jake showed y'all how a battery operated blasting machine works. We're gonna show y'all now ones that don't need a battery but are still electric. These both use a magneto, which basically functions to generate electricity. This one right here is an M57 firing device for a Claymore. And what you do is to generate the electricity is you just push down on that and that generates electricity. The advantage of these are that you don't need a battery because you generate your own electricity. The other one here is a blasting machine that we got from Boss Firearms. They're in College Station, Texas. Make sure to check them out. We're borrowing it from them. And what this right here does is it uses a similar way, but it twists and that right there generates an impulse to send it down the wire and set off the charge. So here's the one that we borrowed from Boss Firearms in College Station. We haven't used this one before, so we're going to see what happens. But you have to actually turn this thing. We have to turn it several times to actually get enough energy to set it off. But we'll see what happens. Woo! That worked right away. So next up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna show y'all the M57 firing device used here with an MRUD, which is similar to an M18 Claymore. Now, a lot of folks, for some weird reason, are insistent upon that there's some sort of metal back in with a uh, Claymore. One dude was talking about this experience at Sapper School. <laughs> Sapper School, <laughs> that's like a drill weekend course. <laughs> I'm sorry, just making fun of y'all little sapper girls. But anyways, um, was saying he took apart a Claymore at get <laughs> sapper school and said that there was a metal backing on the back of it. And that makes absolutely no sense because there's no such thing as a metal backing for a Claymore. And if you were to have that, what would happen is it would actually send something flying back right at the folks that are setting it off, which is what you don't want to do. It's a directional mine supposed to send the fragmentation one way, not send a blast back towards you. What it uses it has this curved effect right here, which Jake could talk about all day long the science behind it i just know that hey point it this way towards the enemy and make sure it's not pointing back at you but what we'll do is we'll show how this m57 clacker works and what it does uses a magneto to generate the electricity and then send it down the line and set it off all right well i'm wearing a different shirt because it's a whole different day yesterday was a little bit of a i don't know how to say it a freaking disaster we had everything go wrong you name it right now we're getting ready to get some rain so we're trying to get this film before the rain shows up but we're going to talk about real quick how to do the testing on the claymore clacker again we're not going to do this doctrinally correct because well this is ordnance lab not the army and i haven't actually done one of these since freaking a very long time ago in a swamp far far away in florida at the benning school for boys and what you do though before you go ahead and initiate with the claymore you want to make sure of course that it works because nothing be worse than trying to set off an ambush by sitting there hearing this in the woods and nothing happened and you want to make sure that um, it goes boom whenever you actually want it to so what you do you got your m57 firing device you have your uh, what's the term for this? this is the m40 testing device and you made them together and what happens is that whenever you're actually using it is that you're gonna get a little bit of light in there on the m40 and that right there confirms that the clacker is actually working and it's gonna be getting enough of a charge to actually set off the cap that's in the claymore one of those weird moments where you realize that I never actually personally clacked off a Claymore in the Army. I've actually only done my own privately owned Claymores, so I guess I'm one of the very few people in the world that can actually say that. So, let's make it happen. Clack, clack goes the gat. <laughs> Woo! All right guys, for the last method of setting off explosives, we have the last ditch effort, which is just a big battery. And as I explained before, this is not the best method to set off explosives, but it's kind of like a, well, last ditch resort. You know, if you need something to set it off, 
Uh, <laughs> it's not the best one, but if you, the blasting machine fails or the clacker fails, you still have this. And as I explained before, the limitations are because batteries are at a lower voltage, you can't use it over long distances of wire. But in this case, we have about 100 meters of wire out towards a uh, charge of a Gemini explosive we have out there. We put about a, roughly 500 grams of explosive, which is the leftover amount of explosives that we we mixed up originally for the Claymore. And we're going to do is demonstrate that you can use this method to set it off. It's not the best method. I hate it, but we've used it before sometimes because sometimes the blasting machines fail. So uh, let's get this party started. So we have it set up to the spool, and you take this and you connect it to the terminals and fire in the hole. And voila! Sets off the explosive. Well, at the beginning of this, we were going to do both the electric and the non-electric, but we've realized as making this right here, not only has it been an epic disaster trying to film these the last three freaking days, we also realize it's quite long. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this up into two separate videos. We'll do a follow-on one where we're going to go out there and do the non-electric one, showing y'all the no-nail and also the fused caps and all that good stuff. But hopefully y'all enjoyed this explanation of the electrical stuff. When we recorded the stuff with Jake explaining the electricity. I kind of zoned out as a history major, but it was very interested, I'm sure, for those of y'all nerds that like that stuff. But thanks for watching, and we'll see y'all next time here at Ordnance Lab.